I guess it is. I guess it is. There we go. Awesome. Because as we were just sitting here joking, we're like, uh, this is absolutely the slot to see who made it to bed early and who has already, ooh, and now I'm everywhere. This is awesome. We called, we called it the hangover slot, so welcome. Yeah. And of course, we only have one microphone, so the good news is that works better. So welcome everyone, and we're gonna take a little bit of a different approach, I guess, to, than just presentation slash panel. Because one of the issues with this is it's an evolving space when we're talking about the data and the privacy and all the issues with, uh, I mean, if you ask anyone to define, as Britain's gonna talk about, like some of the aspects of the data privacy in XR, I mean, we don't even have a common definition for some of the technology, so then how are you gonna define what it's doing? So I'm Liz, and this is Britain, and we're gonna talk, first Britain's gonna lay a great foundation foundation and give us a framework from which to have a discussion. And then the idea is we'll talk amongst ourselves and then once y'all have had an opportunity to uh, wake up, have you know, get the brain cells firing, then we thought we would open it up to a conversation and questions from the group. So bear with us and I'm gonna let a much smarter person than I introduce the topic and uh, Explain a little bit of where some of the challenges lie. Question one, can you hear me? Awesome. Question two, who's heard of Lego Universe? All right, I, I have a salty story for your Sunday morning about, about Lego Universe. Lego Universe was a highly anticipated massive multiplayer online game like Roblox, Minecraft, that ended up being shuttered. The experience looked great, and the company was really looking to allow users to build their own type of content and their own environments. But given how utterly trusted LEGO was as a brand, they committed to whitelisting content before it went live. So they were gonna preview everything to make sure it was safe for you and your kids. The only problem was that there is a term in content moderation that Lego did not think about, and it's called time to penis. Time to penis literally means the duration between a person entering a virtual world and adult content appearing in that virtual space. And with all puns intended for LEGO Universe, the time to penis was not very long. The <laughs> LEGO needed, amongst other things, to figure out an automated, scalable, economical way to prevent teenagers and kids from drawing penises in the virtual world, and they couldn't do it. It became a wide-scale problem, and it actually ended up killing the project. This is not an unusual story. Many companies find that their expectations about governing and moderating user behavior and user, user data flows in spatial computing are turned on their head. My name is Britton Heller, and I like to describe myself as the lawyer of the black mirror. I am a visiting scholar at the Virtual Human Interaction Lab at Stanford University, and I teach international law and AI policy, and I've been focusing on immersive environments for about seven years. There are three things that I would like you to take away today. One, immersive media has a different impact on our bodies and our minds, and this is what differentiates it from flat screen social media. Existing privacy law does not accommodate for this. Two, the different technical stacks between flat screen social media and um, immersive content mean that we have different layers of enforcement when you're looking at behavioral tracking and modification in XR. And three, AI will not save us. And that one is worth repeating twice. AI will not save us. Overall, the systems that we create in 3D environments are fundamentally different 
from 2D environments because of the technical stack, the potential impact on users, and the uninformed state of the law. This leads us to three questions. What kinds of data flows do you get from XR environments? What does this mean for business models and the law? And why does this matter to users? Imagine that you and I are playing a race car oriented game in XR. And I see this red McLaren and I really, really like this car. I was gonna say a Tesla, but the one that they're hacking over there, I don't know if it's actually gonna be able to drive after this week. So I like the Tesla, you can, I like the McLaren, you can like the Tesla. Um, when I see this car, my body starts to physiologically react to my pleasure. So my heart rate goes up a little bit, my skin gets a little more moist, my pupils dilate. I really like this car. Later on, as we're walking around the conference and we go into a different experience, I see a similar red car drive by, driven by someone who looks more than a little bit like me. I go to a virtual sports bar, and someone who looks exactly like my crush says, isn't it a great time to buy a new car right now? I go to my email and I start getting targeted ads from Geico about why I should re-up my car insurance. This sounds like science fiction, but the framework for it actually already exists. Companies have been putting advertisements in XR environments since t um, 2021, I believe it was announced. And I've written papers about how advertisements in immersive contexts are actually experiential. They don't look like billboards. You actually pay for the privilege of having the car advertised to you. I developed a term called biometric psychography to describe the potential for this harm, where your likes, dislikes, and consumer preferences are married with your physiological reactions, often involuntary. This is not against the law. This is not covered by normal privacy law, because privacy law covers your personal identifying information and when you and I entered into the game, I had a verifiable billing address. I had a user account with my authentic identity. The companies know who we are. That's not what's at issue. It's the inferences about our behavior and our physiology and our preferences that are really at risk. So it's your mental privacy, not your identity. So privacy law is not the right regime to deal with this. It it actually makes me a little bit upset because I'm, I'm a lawyer and I'm like, ah, I don't like it when new technologies are a misfit with existing law. There are, because there are different psychological and neurological impacts than socializing with people in video game worlds, I'd like to review the three characteristics that make something immersive. And I think that when you understand this, you, you really get that this is, this is not flat screen media anymore. First is presence. Presence has been studied in communications departments for decades, and it, it, formally it's called the illusion of non-mediation. When you go into an XR environment, it feels real. The first thing that we do at the Virtual Human Interaction Lab when we have somebody visit is I have them walk the plank. I put them in an experience where they are over a chasm and they are walking along the plank because nothing brings the feeling of presence to you more acutely than feeling that vertigo and feeling your heart rate rise and seeing how your physiology reacts to the screens and the spatial audio and the impact to show you that this is not a Twitter feed, this is not Facebook, and therefore we, maybe we shouldn't be regulating it in the same way. Jeremy Balenson, who's the founding director of the lab, says we should think of VR not as a media experience, but closer to an actual experience. And the visceral pit in your stomach you get when you have fear of heights, that's, that's what that is. And we do that before talking about empathy and education and, and 
all of the other benefits of VR so that people understand its power. Second is immersion, and that's when users really feel like they're in a virtual environment. A, a virtual violin performance has to have all of the trappings of watching a performance in an actual theater. Different views from different seats, different movement flows through aisles, spatially oriented sound. So it's, um, it's the way that XR experiences use your sensory input to stimulate the user through light, sound, sense, tactile, input. Finally, there's embodiment, and this is my favorite one because it reminds me of Looney Tunes. Embodiment is the feeling like your avatar or your virtual body is your actual body. Uh, and a researcher named Mel Slater took a famous social psychology experiment called the rubber hand experiment. And he had people look down in VR and see a rubber hand placed in front of them and then proceeded to go Looney Tunes on it, to hit it with a mallet, to stab it, to really abuse the virtual arm. And when you watch the recordings of these, you can, you can find them on YouTube, people scream, people jump, people react like it's their actual arm. This is the power of embodiment, and it can be beneficial in medical applications if somebody has phantom limb pain where you want to show them an arm that is not theirs and have their brain actually associate what happens to that with their physiognomy. But it also can place users at risk considering the violence and other user harms that we're starting to see emerge in, in XR. So if this feels so real to our bodies, what does it do to our minds? Tom Furness, who is one of the inventors of VR headsets, says that when something happens to you in XR, it's like it's imprinted on your brain in permanent ink. The experiences that you have in a virtual environment are processed through your hippocampus in the same way that you create memories like, like you and I sitting here having a conversation today. It's more like entering somebody's living room and screaming in their face than it is reading critical words on Facebook or Twitter. Because of how XR impacts our bodies and our minds, it's a mistake to just cut and paste terms of service from flat screen social media and presume that they're gonna do the same thing. And that sounds really obvious, but that's what a lot of companies are doing these days. Second, I promised we'd talk about different stack layers and moderation vectors in spatial computing. What that means in normal people speak is that when you do content moderation on Facebook or Twitter, you look at two things, conduct and content. When you move in from a 2D to a 3D environment, you have to look at content, conduct, and environment. So the architecture of your world, like we talked about with the penises in LEGO Universe, becomes a moderation factor, one that you don't have when you have a text-based social media environment. That means that there are actually different ways to mess with people in XR worlds. I like to think about spam and how does spam translate into XR. Pretend you and I are uh, tired of my sports car and so we go to a sports bar. And in the sports bar, I can buy Liz a beer. I don't want Liz coming to my bar though or, or playing on my pool table, so I buy her so many beers that it fills up the virtual pool table and she can't play the game. Impeding a user's gameplay in an XR environment is the functional equivalent to spam in a flat screen computing environment, but it would never be defined as such if you didn't think about it in three dimensions. I'm going to skip a little bit ahead because we have a lot to talk about. Um, three, platforms are having a lot of challenges trying to create trust and safety regimes and privacy regimes because of all of these complicating factors. This is an, a new form of media with new impacts on your body and mind. You need new rules. A lot of people ask, why didn't LEGO just create a filter to screen out all the penises? 
And the, the, the answer was that most social media content is moderated by automated filters in an ex-ante fashion. So before it ever hits a flat feed. Facebook takes 97% of hate speech off before you ever see it. And the way that they do this is by using classifiers. So it's, it's a, basically a huge AI profanity filter. This is not possible in the XR context yet. We, we don't have scalable, affordable, reliable ways to create classifiers for 3D environments. We don't have the data sets yet to use. Computer vision is the, is the way that I think we're going to be able to do this, but think about all the different ways you can describe a cat. We don't have publicly available data sets yet to try to audit what a cat would actually be in its, in its many forms and colors and shapes and sizes. Currently when companies do content moderation, one, they just don't do it for XR. Two, they use a voice to text transcription and then run it through social media filters, which does not catch context or behavioral or environmental factors. Or three, they try to, try to use real-time behavioral tracking, which is just not scalable and puts the burden on users. When you report a violation in a, a platform like Horizon Worlds, it takes one to two minutes of content and gives it to the company. That normally is not enough to determine the context of what's actually happening. And, when you've watch, and if you watch videos of people who are reporting abuse happening, you, 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 you often can't tell who is saying what to whom and what's happening, especially in 60 seconds. Reporting is done differently as well on every different platform. So that's like if, if we went to Vegas and you call 911, but then if you went to Henderson and you had to send them a fax, and then if you went to Reno and you had to show up in person. If you, when you use public safety services, if you had to call for help in a different way in every different city you went to, you would never use 911. And I think companies are finding that it's the same way if you don't have standardized safety protocols across different XR platforms and XR worlds. Generative AI looks promising as a tool to help, but it does not yet have the discretion or the contextual understanding necessary to help with the nuance that will be required for helping to modify or govern user behavior. Realistically, AI-based solutions are several years away from having sufficient sophistication, enough data, and adequate training to work in spatial environments. So, overall, the differences between social media and XR are stark. And they emerge from the interactive features of immersive experiences and the neurological impacts that this has on users. And this has resulted in violations of what I call the right to mental privacy. Other scholars in Chile have called this neuro rights. Um, brain computer interface scholars are talking about a, um, is it a, like a battle for your brain. There's a new book that came out um, discussing that. And it, they're all part and parcel of the same thing, where the sanctity of the content of your thoughts and the the inferences that can be made about your health and, and your, your sexual preferences, your political preferences, your gender, your age, all of these things we can determine from data flows really shouldn't be used to send you advertisements. If so, I think it's, it's actually a failure of the imagination. Yeah, I think that's a, a good way to turn it to Liz. And one of the things that really strikes my mind is it's not just the gaming experience that this is moving beyond so many different aspects and potential. So as Britton was talking about, like moving into the healthcare environment, that your healthcare will be delivered potentially through this data that is being collected 
from your physical reactions. So the questions start to become, is this data painting a correct picture? Is this the full picture? Is it picking up on all the nuances? And who's getting access to that? And there's a big difference between what I may post on social media at 2 a.m. when I am fired up about something and what I would actually say or do. Or you think of a lot of the, um, as we saw during remote environments where people were having job interviews over Zoom or other uh, conference calling. And a lot of it dealt with, there were companies and some states have started taking a harder look at this where they were creating biases. That if you didn't make the proper amount of eye contact or if it looked like you were distracted during, because the sensors on the screen weren't picking this up properly, that suddenly you were getting penalized during your job interview because you weren't meeting this set standard. And so now what happens when we take that and all of those AI data sets that are expecting certain behaviors, they're not expecting children to start drawing inappropriate things, uh, which anyone who's been in an elementary school, you should have expected it. And you should have expected fart jokes. You should have expected lots of poop. Um, and all those different things. But what happens when we're trying to create protections and we're trying to do all this with a bias towards like we're already starting so far behind. And now we're taking all these other little cues of how does the VR headset, like how does that experience know that it wasn't because a spider crawled across your foot or someone else in the room thought it would be hilarious to tap you on the shoulder as you were playing the game or or I'm not saying this has ever happened I've definitely never done this to someone I'm um, playing but what happens if you move furniture while they're in the middle of and suddenly they're tripping over something because it was really freaking funny and it just you know serves them right but suddenly that reaction is getting captured and how do you know that I haven't logged into Britain's account? That I'm not playing as her and should I be so lucky to have all the sensors pick up and be like, mm, you have the same facial you know, structure, you have all this, I'm like, yes I do. Yes, that's right. Or you're just off today. Or heavens forbid, I think of all the times I've tried to log in uh, to my iPhone and it's like facial recognition, not recognition. I'm like, wait, what? Do you, what? No. Oh my God. Are you telling me I didn't get enough sleep last night? And suddenly, or, oh God, is my resting bitch face back? Like, oh, I didn't mean to do that. So how do regulators and how do you work all those different aspects in, because we're already playing catch up. One, one of the things that I like to do when I, when I talk to regulators is tell them the, the type and quality of information you can get about a person from these data flows. And I realize I didn't mention that before. Uh, there was a study that came out last week. So this is the absolute newest information from UC Berkeley. And the, studier, uh, the study said that a machine learning model was able to accurately predict the height, weight, age, marital status uh, um, of a user in XR um, by the way they moved. So the I know earlier I said that it doesn't go into the realm of personal identifying information, but initial studies are starting to show that you can actually tell somebody's um, foot size by the way they move. The lab at Berkeley and the lab at Stanford uh, have had some similar studies, and Berkeley came out with a, a study that said with, I think it was 100 seconds of recorded data you could uniquely identify a person in XR with 94% accuracy from a data set of 50,000 people. Stanford did this earlier, but the data set was you know, a couple thousand people. It wasn't statistically significant. 
50,000 people. That might be you in the Taylor Swift crowd. By the way that you tilt your head and point can be uniquely identified in an immersive environment. The type of um, medical and sort of human rights oriented information that I'm concerned about really, really is tied into eye tracking. So the type of information you can get by somebody's pupil reaction, is you can tell who somebody's sexually attracted to. You can tell whether or not somebody's likely to be telling the truth. And you can also tell whether or not somebody shows preclinical signs of certain medical ailments, like schizophrenia, ADHD, Parkinson's, and Huntington's. These are preclinical signs, so these are things that you may not know about yourself yet. Your doctor may not know about you yet. And this, um, and a company, if they were to parse the data set, w would have access to that information. This is what I mean by the right to mental privacy. It's not just the content of your thoughts, it's the implications that can be made about who you uniquely are, your medical conditions, and the type of behaviors that you may choose to engage in or not. And one of the things we're seeing is the states are starting to try to play catch up because keeping in mind, data brokers are taking this information and creating these pictures and they're selling them. And the regulations really are not keeping up with who should have access to this and how do we protect it. And it's also what happens if it gets wrong, that that one out of 50,000, it's wrong. And but yet this is now flagged in a file and it's, you know, as a child you're told this will go down in your permanent record. Well, how do we fix that permanent record when it's our biometric and it's our mental information that, oh wait, you know, objection, your honor. Um, I was just having a bad day and that wasn't me. Um, or the, you know, it, that was someone else at that piece of information. So it's not the entire picture that gets off. It's just one piece. How do you fix that? I don't have a good answer for that. I, I wish I did. Um, because right now these, these type of data sets aren't auditable by the public. In, in certain jurisdictions, people are proposing a right to have all the your user information about you available, but these are, these are profiles made to sell you something. It's not an essential part of your, your user account and things. A another thing I tell regulators is um, that you can't outsmart the machine. Because a lot of them think that, you know, I, I'm, somebody advertising something to me, that's obvious. That's, that, that's not, uh, I'm not going to fall for that. In XR environments, you can actually switch out elements in the environment at blink rate. It's, it, it's been done in experimental context, but there's nothing saying that you could, ha you could have somebody with a can of soda and switching out Coke and Pepsi and tracking somebody's more positive reaction to one versus the other. It's kind of like that social psychology experiment where you're told to count the number of basketball passes and so you miss the gorilla walking in the background. It, it's a similar type of a dynamic where people think they're smarter than the system, but the system works faster than you can articulate your preferences or requests cognitively. And that's, that's, that's a really kind of funky, scary thing, you know? If you, watch, if you watch sports, and Liz is here, and I'm back in California, Liz and I will actually see different ads behind the players. Augmented advertising is already a thing, and it's based on your, um, it's based on your zip code. And somebody in the stadium will see even different ads than Liz or I would see on different network channels. They sell this space. So advertisement is, in immersive context, is more about targeting and personalization than it is in an offline context. And that makes sense, but the capacity 
and the ability to really target it to people makes XR the most persuasive medium that, that we've developed so far. And one of the things that we saw, and we keep going back to that, is the data sets. What is it getting, based on where are those data sets getting built from that are creating some of these models and being able to audit it? And being able to audit and get to your information and make sure, like, hey, is this the picture that I see? And basing it on a bias towards, well, English-speaking, U.S.-based things when you're talking about an immersive experience that is intended to open up the world. Like, the idea is that you were playing and you were experiencing things with people in any different physical location. So now how do you build the rules and even train that it's getting it right when not everyone's gonna look the same, react the same, and different cultures have built in different you know, mannerisms. And as we saw with a lot of the, you know, again, even just trying to unlock your iPhone, Heavens forbid, you're a woman of color. Because guess what? All of the modeling that was based on was not you. Not even a little bit. And so they had to go back and say, oops, our bad. Well, now what do we do when we're talking about collecting all this data? And it's like on the reactions of, you know, we talk about a lot in the medical world, a lot of the early training was done and it wasn't done based on women's bodies and it wasn't based on, so it's like oh well you're going to react to this medication in the following manners or these are the following symptoms it's like but but n- no I, I'm not so now you've got the VR and it's assuming heavens forbid I don't want to be a redhead middle aged woman in my like I want to be a kick-ass, like, ninja dragon, whatever the hell I want. So how are we going to start building that and work on regulators when you've got, because, again, heavens forbid, heavens forbid that Australia, the U.S., New Zealand, like, insert country, get the upper hand in being the regulator who sets the rules for this. Because, oh no, we can't let Canada do that. I mean, they're just nice and maple syrup. And, you know, so how how do you broach those conversations when you're going all over the world and talking to them and saying, no, 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 we need to let this country take the lead on it or play nice with them and not share the data? If y'all notice, I give Britain all the really hard questions because this is what she gets for being so smart and being a professor shaping young minds that are creating this future. So, sorry. But those aren't young minds. Those are like crusty old minds. That's why I'm like, hmm, about this. A lot of people in Europe argue that GDPR should cover it. They, they argue that Article 1 of GDPR should cover all of the privacy protections for XR and then we're done. I take issue with that uh, because these are new types of data flows and they're not really anticipated by the regulatory structure. And they're, they're more akin to medical data to me than they are personal identifying information. Um, the Future on Privacy Forum just did a, a really, really optimistic study where they determined that biometric laws are, biometric laws in the U.S. are covered by state-based law. And if you have a business that creates XR project, um, products, you know this because there are certain states you're really, really worried about selling in and certain states you may choose to not release your product in. And those may be um, Illinois, Washington, or Texas. There are other states that have privacy laws, not biometric laws, but you, you think about, sometimes I talk to regulators and I ask them um, if they've tried smell vision And they look at me like I'm nuts. And I tell them that in the lab and in commercial context now, you can actually go before a campfire in XR 
and you don't just hear the campfire and you don't just see the campfire, you can actually smell the charcoal. And in the lab, we put a little toasted marshmallow in there as well, just for fun. You can go into a garden and smell flowers. The, this, these type of inputs are really not anticipated by law. Um, also, haptic. I, there was a company that um, recently released a breath gauge for a meditation app. And my question for them is, is that biometric data? It could be body-based data based on some of the states. So it would be regulated as such. In other states, it wouldn't be. I think the way that I make regulators understand this is I, I try to actually bring them into the developer's mindset and bring them into the, the chair of somebody who has to make a decision about selling and producing these products and, and doing so in an environment that is ambiguous at best. Some countries are better about it than others. Um, Australia has an e-safety commissioner's office, so they're very, very motivated. New Zealand is very concerned about public um, safety in the online context. France has had a, a national metaverse strategy. China and Colombia and um, one other country, they have started to hold trials in the metaverse. Don't do that, by the way. That's not a good idea. Um, so countries are in starting to engage in little ways. I think Bahamas had, a, um, had an, an embassy in the metaverse. I think the way to actually get to these countries is to talk to them more about their economies and corporate environments, and that should get them more motivated rather than talking about digital diplomacy and, and um, kind of a new sovereign space or other, other type of nonsense things. When you think about how even in the U.S., a lot of our uh, it, laws that touch on things that we deal with a day, day to day, the like DMCA, CFA, a lot of them came because members of Congress, for example, were afraid that their blockbuster rental history was going to be published. Oh, yeah. It, or they saw a movie and they said, you know what? War games, huh? Huh. So I, I love that idea of putting it in that personal context because unfortunately that does ground it for them and show them because so often we spend time chasing the technology like, oh, we have to react to this when it's like, no, let's look at what it's actually doing. What is it doing at its core? What is the actual concern? And then how do we build from there? So I love that you're getting them that hands-on, but how do y'all scale that kind of advocacy? Or how do we, as a community of users who are concerned about, or builders, you know, how do we take that idea and that approach and scale it beyond, you know, and bring it down to that local level or that regional level of, hey, do this, see this, experience this, and know that this is going to impact what you're doing. I think you don't use law. Uh, I want to call out someone in the front row, uh, Caroline Sinders, whose research about how to use effective design to create healthy online communities and environments is awesome. Um, yay. Uh, so looking at, at design-based principles, looking at social psychology about how we create cultures. Uh, some of my very boring academic work focuses on the theory of code as law and how that has ignored norms. And norms are the way that we create culture and we self-regulate our own online environments. And try not to place the full burden on on users, but distribute it collectively amongst a whole community. I, that, it seems like a cop-out answer because I'm a lawyer, but some, th this isn't a legal problem, I think. It's, it's more of a, a social problem and an issue of, of science not catching up to politics. Well, and I think that also putting it on the users overlooks 
the builders, the makers. Like if we are intentional from the design aspect, and when I say we, I mean the people at the companies who are building it from product to engineering to all that understanding and seeing that big picture and knowing when to call it like, oh, this is going to impact this. Let's be intentional. Let's bring them into the conversation. So as a DEF CON community, I think that's one of the easiest ways to start reaching out. It's like, start the change. And I think we can also be really intentional about how we design these products and who we are accommodating when we design them. How many people here are familiar with simulator sickness? Probably a bunch. If you're not, it's if you've gone into a VR world and you feel s nauseous and sick to your stomach and really disoriented, that's simulator sickness. In the earlier iterations of headsets, more women than men reported simulator sickness and people started to write about this and some said it was just my delicate female constitution and the, uh, the fact that I may, uh, I may produce babies one day or the fact that I um, don't play first person shooter games. It's all bullshit. What actually was happening was that the headset was designed for an average male form between 5'10 and 6 feet tall. There is one measurement that is essential to preventing you getting simulator sickness. It's the interpupillary distance, the distance between your eyes. If you go to the optometrist, they measure this to put you in a pair of prescription glasses. The interpupillary distance on early VR headsets was not adjustable. So it was akin to putting 51% of the population in the wrong pair of glasses. No wonder women were reporting sickness and discomfort. And there were studies following that by Jessica Outlaw that actually showed people what women weren't returning to VR environments because they felt uncomfortable. There were similar studies that came out, uh, one from the MIT Media Lab where there was a researcher doing her master's thesis work in Nairobi. She took Oculus Go to try to put it on, um, on Kenyan entrepreneurs. And she found that with the women, 50% of the time, the, the strap snapped when she tried to fit it over their hair. 50% of the time. She ended up deviating from her master's thesis to design an adjustable fucking strap. Easy fix if you think about the wide, beautiful variety of people who you want to be your customers. It's smart to think about the wide diversity of body shapes and types. Disabled populations are some of the earliest adopters of XR hardware. And they are the last people that many companies think about when they design these products and services. Oculus didn't change their vantage point to make it adjustable whether or not I was standing or sitting until update 31. And it came on the heels of a Scientific American article that showed that somebody had to modify an Xbox controller to use a rock climbing game. They were a user with muscular dystrophy and so th they really wanted to know what rock climbing felt like. And they had to modify it themselves because the game wouldn't accommodate them. We, this is something that we can do as a community. So when you're, when you're doing your, your prototype testing or your, your platform building or your experience, experiential design, think about all of the people you want in your world and then go bigger. Yeah, and I think bringing it back to what Britton was talking about before is like that full stack of an understanding it's not a level playing field. And by that I mean it's not a flat screen. And so as you're building it and as you're designing, taking all of those different aspects and also incorporating it into the conversations on the biometric data, like what exactly? So we're not using those same definitions. It's not the same game and being, again, intentional in how you're building, how you're designing, but also how you're approaching it. And be it with the conversations you're having with, you know, regulars as you're watching that. I think really just kind of bringing it all, this is not, 
you know, this is an immersive environment. It is the entire all-encompassing environment. And there's some best practices that you can follow as, as developers or even as security experts. Well, the, a best practice for, for XR is to actually keep the, the data on device. That, that means that you have to get a warrant to access the data. The problem with that is it, it really impedes your processing speed. It's very, very expensive. It kind of drains your battery. Um, so the other thing you can do is when you're looking to third-party cloud providers, you can be really deliberate about asking them about their data retention, storage, um, disposal, all of their data policies, because what your third-party data provider does is basically what you do. And, and being a savvy customer. So pushing back if there aren't privacy protective services like you feel meets the threshold that you want, that you want for, to protect your users. No, and that's excellent because the change starts with calling it out and bringing it to the attention of and paying attention because you also think of all the different users and whether they're going to understand, you know, a, a 12 year old child is not going to care about all their different things, but it's like all they know is there's a lag time and they're annoyed. It's like, no, let's, let's make sure that we are paying attention, that we are bringing it in, and that we are reporting it, raising it. It's kind of like the name and shame of, hey, this is a great game that you've created for children or geared towards this market. Now you're creating their permanent record for their school. For that, you know, the equivalent of that, that example that's going to follow them forever and is going to be based on AI modeling and data points that are not necessarily accurate. I mean, they're going to be based on, if we're looking at the early sets, the 511, 510 male, you know, interactions and all of that different things. So what is, like, if you had to think of, like, one kind of way to bring it home of how you're, how you're dreaming of electric sheep, uh, what are some good takeaways other than, I mean, I love what you were saying with the proactive steps. What are, like, what's a good nugget? What's, what's the quote? It's the hangover spot on Sunday morning. I don't know if I have a quote. Uh, <laughs> Someone asked what is inspiring in this space, which is a great question to end on because it's all doom and gloom when I go to the dinner party. XR is magic. It's magic. It makes, it can, it can make you feel like you are in a different body. You start to embody the characteristics of your avatar in a social environment within two minutes. So if I make myself an eight foot tall dragon, I'm gonna dominate that space in two minutes. It takes two and a half minutes for me to put you in my lab context and give you a third arm and have you pop three balloons at the same time. Neuroplasticity is magic. XR is a means to access your neuroplasticity. Your imagination is really the limit and we've never had a technology like this before. So let's not fuck it up. That's my quote. I like that. No, thank you so much. And thank you to the XR Village for uh, bringing this topic, inviting us. Uh, please go check it out if you haven't already. I'm Lawyer Liz on Twitter. Please feel free to engage. And I'm Britton Heller. You can find me as Britton Heller on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Thank you so much.